Hey, welcome to Spearhead Sundays. I have a crippling illness. So here's a guest episode with my very good friend Greeley that's incredibly interesting, filmed a few months ago. Um, come and see me live at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival. I only have two weeks of shows left. I'm performing every single night except for Monday nights. And I want to see you there at loosespears.com. Come and see me uh, because uh, it's the only thing I can do right now because uh, I do that and then I end up in bed and then uh, I upload old podcasts. So enjoy. Greeley, welcome back to Spearhead Sundays. Hey. Happy to have you. Uh, Grilly's here in Melbourne. We're recording yeah. this from a secret location. Ooh. Might be a little bit echoey, but this is the podcast now that I have no staff. Yeah, it's the, uh, <laughs> it's the back cave on the 32nd floor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is a strange place you've taken me to. I've got yeah. To get, I'm going to get eaten later. Yeah, you could do. Yeah, just watch your drink. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah, that's pretty crazy, eh? What do you reckon about, like... How do you think, you know, in regards to... Because, I mean, we've never, in our lifetime in Australia, we've never lived in the sort of uh, time or environment where something like Jeffrey Dahmer was happening. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, I watched a doco about the Son of Sam. Well, maybe we're living it right now, but he's really fucking good and yeah. hasn't got caught. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's probably, you know... I guess, yeah, who knows what's happening now. Yeah. But, like, do you know what I mean? Like, my dad being in America growing up, when the Washington sniper was happening, I was fucking scared every day mm. in Tasmania. You yeah. know what I mean? I was just like, is my dad going to get killed? Is my dad going to get killed? You was know what I mean? I don't know about that one. So the Washington uh, sniper is one of the few serial killers that were black. Right. Yeah, and... Um, it's a very white hobby. Yeah, yeah, it definitely people. has... Well, like, I know there's a really good doco called The Killing of America. Yeah. And it's made in the 80s, and it kind of explains America's fascination with violence and the yeah. progression over it after the wars when, um, you know, mass shootings sort of started trending yeah. and then serial killers. Because there was a certain time where it evolved. There were serial killers that just killed people. Mm. And... But usually it was to do with, like, rape or, you know, it was, like, other aspects. And then yeah. it evolved into this, nah, just kill people, you know, yeah. for no reason at all. I think it's, it's like, a lot of it is like the school shooter thing. Or like yeah. The news makes them famous and it makes an unhinged person go, oh, that's an option. I can yeah. do that. Yeah. And then I can get notoriety for myself. Yeah. It's I, like... Uh, it's de- I don't think that's definitely the main drive. It de- I reckon a lot of them comes from very self-destructive I mean I guess the notoriety feeds the ego on the way out yeah it seems to me I haven't been following all the school shootings in America but it seems that they're not killing themselves at the end of it as much no I, I think it's because they they want to be famous yeah. I think like that's why they're writing their manifestos and yeah that's why they're doing you know crazy shit in courtrooms yeah. during the trial is so they can get their message out there even more yeah. Because, you know, that's why, you know, fucking people are live streaming it now, mm. you know, while they're doing it. That's like, yeah, that's there seems nice. to be no other reason to do that other than to make your crime the most known crime yeah, or to, to, put, to push your fucked up message. Yeah. No, you're right there. 100%. But, yeah, I just think it's interesting right now that, um, yeah, Jeffrey Dahmer's the hot topic and the whole world's obsessed with it again. And this... I, you know, I do feel for, like, a lot of people that were in those areas that were alive in those times because yeah. I knew how scared I was with my dad being in America. And yeah. my dad actually was pretty close to the Washington sniper when it was happening. He was only, like, I don't know if he was... If what did he do? Did he just shoot people from... Uh, so, yeah, so he was randomly... I think it was from the boot of his car. He was hiding in the boot of his car and making a hole and, like, snipering people... Out of that. And they're just driving away. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And um, yeah, so he was just randomly going to different places like shopping center, car parks, and things like that. <laughs> and just, yeah, people just getting boof, sniping. Yeah. And I can't remember how many people he killed, but that's my sort of, yeah, one of my memories of growing up when a serial killing was out at large in America. And because my dad was close to there, like, um, yeah, it was a scary thing. And I know with like when the Son of Sam happened, and that actually wasn't just one guy. That was actually a whole satanic cult. What's that one? I haven't heard of this. So the Son of Sam was a guy, and I'm pretty sure it was New York. Yeah, it was. And um, so 
it's interesting because there's a doco come out recently that explains a lot of it more. But what I heard when I was reading serial killer books when I was a kid yeah. was this guy called Son of Sam thought his neighbour's dog was Satan and yeah. he was telling him to go kill people. And he was randomly going out in New York and just shooting people in their cars and running off. Right. Right, right drive to save a bomb and killing people that way. But there was a journalist that knew... Sounds that like my cat. <laughs> What's that? It sounds like my cat. What, Satan? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know you had a cat. Yeah, she's a cunt. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to know it. Yeah, well, she probably told me to kill someone. <laughs> That's why I'm here. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, um... And, yeah, so it came out that this journalist got obsessed with it and knew there was more to it. And he spe- the journalist wasted his, the whole of his life dedicated to trying to figure it out. Mm. And he ended up interviewing the guy, but he was actually a part of a satanic cult that they managed to link and tra- trace back to Manson over on the, really? yeah, over on the West Coast. Wow. And it was probably about 10 different people that were doing this. And this Son of Sam guy who was deep in the cult thought it was cool to take the blame for everyone. And I think after 10 years of jail, he was like, oh, no, this is pretty shit. And he kind of... He said he, he, said he killed two people, but at that point, they're like, yeah, you're not leaving jail. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? He was yeah. like, but I didn't do all of them, you know? Yeah. And, um, but, yeah, Son of Sam, because... Cool, well, downgraded to two life sentences then. Huh? Yeah, yeah, fully, yeah. That's it. You're not leaving, cunt. Yeah. Like, but, um, yeah, at that time, the, it, when he was ha- doing it, the entire of America, every woman, woman changed her hairstyle because he was targeting a certain type of women with hairstyles. Really? And so one serial killer, or a few, whatever, yeah. um, affected fashion. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, well, so did Hitler. You don't see the mustache anymore. <laughs> that's you true. Know? <laughs> you imagine being... That's, that's like the hallmark of a really evil person is if you change yeah. hair. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, people still let their hair grow blonde like mum, Brian. <laughs> I don't yeah. know why they haven't changed that. Yeah. I'll be walking the... around any city in Australia and you'll see one guy and go, is that <laughs> You know what I mean? It's, yeah. But yeah, it's just interesting watching it it you know evolve and unfold and i feel for all the people in the world that are being triggered by it and also a bit fascinated with everyone being so fascinated with it yeah i, wa- I watched it and uh was it good it's horrible you yeah, know yeah, like yeah. it's yeah. like so yes yeah. do you know what i mean like i don't know it was just like i st- i watched the first episode and then i checked out i was like i don't want to watch this it's yeah. beautiful yeah. and then i just then i was on tour and i was bored yeah. and i was like oh well i probably should if everyone's fucking watching yeah it. yeah 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 and, it, and it's just horrible and, yeah. it, and it's just like watching it was like oh he wasn't even very good yeah. at it it's just cops were really bad at their job and yeah. hated gay people because they were gross yeah, to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, cops so like, were just racist and homophobic. Gay shit, keep that away from me. Yeah. So they would get, you know, because th- he had a neighbour that called the police like three times yeah. saying, hey, I hear screaming from in from my neighbour's apartment and yeah. you just... Because one 14-year-old boy, this is the worst thing he did. Do you know much about him? Um, I can't remember some of the details. I do, like, you know, like everyone, I do have me moments where I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. good serial killer doco. Yeah. But, like, yeah, you, you tell me. The, so the worst thing he did was, when he was, he was always a weird unit, but he, uh, growing up, he molested this Asian boy. Yeah, right. And then, and then, like, fucking years and years and years later, when he's a man, he picks up that boy's younger brother, 14 yeah, right. years old, pure coincidence, didn't plan it, yeah. just gets the younger sibling of this boy that he molested, yeah. takes him back to his house, drugs him, you know, rapes him and shit. Yeah. The boy escapes, he's 14, covered in blood, shirtless, na- completely naked, off yeah. his head like on drugs yeah, yeah. that he's been given. <clears throat> and then the neighbors find him outside the apartment building. Dharma's gone out to get beer. They call the cops, the cops show up. Dharma shows up with the cops and goes, this is my boyfriend. And their na- and the neighbor goes, this is a child. And the cops are like, ugh, gay shit, yucky. Mm. Just believe Dharma because they don't want anything to do with gay shit. Yeah. Deliver this kid back to Dharma's apartment. Fuck. Who's on drugs, off his head, bleeding. Yeah, yeah. And Dharma goes, oh, you know, we're just having rough sex. Right, this is my boyfriend. He gets drunk, he's an alcoholic. I'll yeah. look after him. They deliver him back. Dharma then fucking kills this kid, 
right? The neighbor that originally called the cops calls him again and goes, I hear murder. Yeah. The cops are like, you don't. We delivered him. He's safe. They're just boyfriend and boyfriend, all right? Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, when they deliver the kid back, they make jokes about, oh, we went into the apartment. We need to be de now. Because yeah, they're like, yeah. Ooh, gay shit. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then he didn't get caught for fucking years after that. Yeah. Hectic, man. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's all just horrible <laughs> and tragic. But right. So I think maybe we, you don't see a lot of that now because there's just such surveillance fucking everywhere yeah yeah definitely it's a lot harder to do that yeah 100 percent yeah it doesn't seem to be you know yeah the the age of the ted bundy's or you know if you look there's a guy in russia there's a guy in russia that had been doing it for years and i think his victim count was up to like 60 yeah and then he he just got sloppy on purpose because he wanted the attention you know yeah but yeah it's been interesting watching that unfold when i was in jail there was always interesting it's when like a big something about a particular serial killer or something was on TV. Yeah. And I kid you not, heaps of cunts were excited for the Ivan Milat special on Friday. <laughs> Serious. <laughs> and it was fucking weird. I was just like, this is so weird. Fellas, like, this is why we're here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, I just, it was an interesting perspective on the world to be inside prison with murderers mm. and they're stoked, government funded looked after watching TV with a theatrical reenactment. Yeah. Like a high budget four yeah. hour special like movie he made about Ivan Milat. It is. You know what I mean? And yeah. it's like all this money one has gone into making the show and then into the prison to keep the murderers there. And yeah. it's like here's your entertainment. And I I kid you not, everyone was like Ivan's on Friday, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. did you watch Ivan last night? Whoa. You know, and I was just like, wow. Yeah. It was, it was interesting. It is, yeah, watching the, the, watching the series, I just had this feeling over and over again, of like, this is definitely, I feel like this is wrong yeah. to be creating entertainment out of this. Yeah. Because, you know, the family of all the victims, they're all still alive. Yeah. There's, there's a bit where they they reenact like word for word exactly as it happened the victim impact statements yeah is that the chicken court yeah, yeah like, I saw like, that and flipping like, out and having a mental yeah breakdown. and they compared the the Netflix version to the original like look yeah. how good it is and it's just like I feel like ugh. you know if you including that I guess is important but if you're gonna do it shot for shot word for word why not just put the actual real footage in there yeah but, you know I feel like reenacting someone the worst day of someone's life is pretty horrific but then it's also like alright well then we can't talk about and make art about horrible people yeah yeah it's such a you can but yeah like yeah for financial gain yeah, that's, that's a hard I mean, yeah. one you know like yeah, that's like, the biggest thing on Netflix right now Dharma like, rates and kills all these like underage yeah, yeah. boys and gay men and Netflix is like beauty that's it and like you know so much, yeah Ted Bundy although I think Ted Bundy was the first court um, procedure yeah. ever televised I think yeah yeah, yeah. you know and, and you know was, the whole and that's well. I get what it does I think it it um, it does slightly trigger your fight, fight or flight in your That's brain. That's what I was getting. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. so you, you watch the reenactment of how these people are killed, like, and the whole moment of them getting lured to the house to then, you know, yeah. in the apartment to then laced with drugs to then tied up and then finally, like, killed. The whole time you're thinking, what would I do? Mm. Would I spot this? Yeah, I, wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't drink that. Or I'm. what if I was this? It's like the whole time, it's just, you're naturally just going, oh, what if this was me? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's this weird, like, like fight or flight thing. And, it is, man. Yeah, towards the, it was what I thought was really, really fucked. Towards the, like in the final episode of, of the Dharma series, um, he's in prison and he's watching TV, he's watching the news, about this other serial killer, John yeah. Wayne Gacy, who killed yeah, like yeah. 40 I men. Know. Yeah, there's a clown. Yeah, he dressed up as a clown yeah, and killed yeah. people. And, but you all, they, they had this whole thing where they reenacted, there was like one of John's murders and it was horrific. And it was like the most violent scene in the entire series was this other serial killer you've never heard of up yeah. until this point. And then it cuts to the news of Dharma watching it and like his reaction to it. Yeah. And I was watching this going, hang on, are they setting up like a cinematic universe like oh, Marvel does on oh, serial 
serial killers? They, they are. That's what that that's is. Exactly it is. That's exactly what That's yeah. exactly what it is. And I finished watching the Dharma oh, thing, fuck. and then I get recommended a, a documentary, so the not a reenactment, of Wayne the Gacy. John Wayne Gacy thing. That's and I feel like I'm in this pipeline of I watch Dharma, and then I watch the documentary about John, and then I bet in a year or two they're going to bring that actor back yeah. to do the John Wayne Gacy series. Of course they are. And I'm like, and, and uh, what after that series is done, he's going to fucking go, oh man. I've, have you heard about the serial killer in Australia? I remember yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's yeah. like a cinematic fucking Boy. universe. Turns it into entertainment. I wonder what it's going to be by the time it gets to the Avengers level. <laughs> <Where they're> like, <laughs> they all, they they all, all just join up together and it's yeah. like, oh, that's so fucked up. <laughs> yeah, they're all, they're all watching the Las Vegas shooter from hell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fucking hell. Uh, yeah, no, you're right, man. It is putrid. I mm. don't really like it. I don't think it's morally fucking... Yeah, I got to the end of it and I was like, I don't think what I got out of it was worth the pain that it probably caused yeah. everyone in that situation. Fucking oath. I think. Well, it's a hard one. It's a hard one because, you know, also... Yeah, I, I, I think, like, it's interesting with comedy, you know, because I've... But I've, really... I've watched so many movies about Hitler and I've loved them. Yeah, yeah, So yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, that's yeah. much worse. Yeah. So... Yeah. It's a good point, man. I guess Hitler seems a lot less hands-on than old Jeffrey Dahmer, so it's a bit... That is true. It's a bit weirdly easier to stomach. Yeah, Hitler, Hitler was... He did worse things, but he seems less evil than... Because he didn't do it himself. He was yeah, more of an evil yeah. administrator. Because I feel that, like... He was sent off nefarious emails. This is an interesting one. <laughs> is... Ordering a genocide yeah. more evil than eating someone? Uh, it causes, yes, it's more, it causes more evil, but yeah. it, it uh, definitely feels less evil. It's weird, isn't it? You're Maybe like, it's just because it's harder to stomach. Yeah, You so. know, like yeah. the kind of idea of eating someone is just like, fuck. You know, that triggers you there, and then you think, well... Well, torture's worse than murder, but I guess Hitler did both. But also, yeah. I feel like our brains aren't equipped to deal with numbers that big. Oh, of course. Like yeah. once We can't even comprehend. Yeah, once you go more than 10, the human brain just starts getting theoretical. Of like, yeah. What does 20 even look like? Yeah, like yeah. 20 things in a room, what does that look like? It's hard to kind of picture, mm. but five things in a room is like, all right, cool. So killing 10 people seems a lot more like evil to your brain than ordering yeah. the genocide of millions because you can't really comprehend no, you can't. millions. Even though you know that's worse, yeah, yeah, it doesn't yeah. feel... Yeah, whereas, you know, yeah, killing someone in a bedroom is just... It's more personal. Just, yeah, the personal side is a yeah. bit weirdly more confronting, I guess. But that's also saying it in Asia we grew up, but I'm sure the... Um, Older generations would have a unique opinion on it. You know what? You know what it is as well. It's like every world leader who's done horrible things, uh, in their mind, their the outcome will be good. Even yeah. though I do this thing, like I'm doing it for this yeah. good reason, even though that's wrong. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. at least are going. No, this yeah. is a hard thing we have to do to get to paradise. Mm. Whereas, like someone like Jeffrey Dahmer is like, I'm gonna rape and kill someone because it's fun. Yeah, yeah. Which is. There's no like, oh, because the world will be better afterwards. It's just a purely selfish. I want yeah, to hurt someone because it's fun. Interesting. Yeah, so it's genocide wrong, even if it's done with good intentions. You know what I mean? Like worse. Sorry, not yeah. wrong. Of course, always, it's fucking always wrong. worse. But does it feel? Worse? Yeah, yeah. Like I mean, well, like <laughs> when Sasha Baron Cohen was interviewing Dick Cheney. Yeah. Yeah, and Dick Cheney, he's he's the guy that's ordered the death of. Fucking who knows how many people in the yeah. Middle East, you know? And, um, yeah, the whole time he's still, you know, in that interview, he's so convinced that he's doing the right thing. Mm. He's so conditioned to believe they're the enemy and yeah. therefore everything he's done is good. He, he said his favourite war was Desert Storm, I think, or some yeah. shit, you know? It's crazy, man. We're off to a good start with the podcast. Yeah, hey? what, a light, what a light start to this comedy podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's worth, Jeffrey Dahmer or the Holocaust? Yeah, we've got no, to... not what's objectively worse. What feels, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Straight to the deep one, man. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, we're in an interest, interesting spot in Melbourne, bro. It's good to be back over in Melbourne, and um, yeah, I did a um, 
the hip hop show on Friday night in mm-hmm. Fitzroy, and then I called Lewis at about five thirty on Saturday because I've been trying to call him for a little while. Yeah, he's been pretty busy and um. And he goes, hey, what are you doing? I said, I'm in Melbourne. And he goes, oh, what are you doing in Melbourne? And I was like, oh, I did a show last night. And he goes, oh, you want to do a set? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. So from Call and Lewis at 5.30, at 7.30, two hours later, I was on stage with the Cougars yeah. in. The last Melbourne show was good. Yeah, yeah. It was, man, it was heaps of fun, bro. Yeah, it was so that's, proud. that's the last of your Melbourne leg of the tour, right? Eh? Yeah, yeah. So I have one in Gold Coast, which will probably, which will have already happened. I've got that on Friday. So if you listen to this, it's already happened. Yeah, and then I've done for touring for probably for the year yep now until until I think March I reckon is when I'll start again yeah, the comedy man. festival and then yeah so how it's many been shows, a fun tour how many shows did you do in Melbourne uh not as many as I, I did a 11 I think <laughs> not as many just 11 <laughs> yeah that's a lot isn't it yeah, 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 yeah maybe in hip hop like rappers will organise a second show yeah. like if they're very lucky a yeah. third you know yeah. what I mean Lewis is like yeah 11 <laughs> <laughs> yeah well they're small you know? yeah 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 we're doing small that's but, cool, um, man. yeah it's been it's been fucking awesome I've gotten so many clips and I feel like I've gotten a lot a lot better oh bro uh, your crowd work the other night was sick yeah it was it was I feel like I've really like unlocked crowd work yeah probably, man. Man. you've just leveled up and what I think you've gotten best at is you've gotten really good at because it's a hard one when you're doing crowd work and also a lot of your style of humour is being straightforward you know like yeah. and you go for the throat and what you've gotten better at is just going for the throat I could tell years ago when I was touring with you You'd think of something funny and you'd be like, oh, and you'd say it and then you'd be like, thanks for coming. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It yeah, was my worst habit. Is, yeah, yeah. Is and I would just, yeah, I would either. You feel would, a little bit bad. You're a lovely person, man. So when you yeah. put a funny joke and jokes, you know, it's hurting feelings and like saying the thing that no one wants to say. Yeah. It's breaking the rules and that's what comedy is. You yes. know what I mean? And yeah, people can get upset, you know. We've roasted each other heaps of fucking gigs, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, what you've gotten better at is just cold doing the crowd work and then just maintaining the serious face. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I noticed that. You've really progressed with it. it was, yeah, because it was, because yeah, that is my humour is, is very like saying the hard thing yeah. and then justifying it with jokes. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But doing that with crowd work is so much harder because you're dealing with a person so you need to not hurt their feelings. Yeah, yeah. But I don't necessarily know how to be funny without saying, like, the hard yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's figuring out how to, like, package yeah. these thoughts in a way that brings the person in but sure. also kind of takes the piss out of them a little bit. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, you want to make the crowd laugh, but never at the at the expense of the person you don't want to hurt their feelings yeah of well. course yeah you want them to because that was always like they're a part of it you know yeah, what I mean? yeah. like, that was always my worst habit was I would go into the crowd and then treat them like they were heckling me mm. you know, I'd be like oh what do you do and they'd answer and then I'd be a cunt and I'm like what am I doing yeah 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 that's it <laughs> but I yeah I think I figured out how to you know make fun with people yeah you, you've gotten very, very good at it bro and like yeah I, I saw you get challenged with it yeah at the show on Saturday when you had the um, a couple on the crowd and someone spoke and you went are you a girl and yeah. and he went oh no I'm trans yeah. and um, and you went okay and yeah so it was a trans couple no, no it was a, tra- a trans and one of the trans one was also kind of a refugee <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's like so he was from he was Palestinian. Yes, yes. Born born a woman in Palestine, yeah. and then fled that country, and then came out as trans yeah. here, and then found a boyfriend. Uh, no, no, no. Got married before she before he transitioned. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and the boyfriend was American. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, and that was um, an interesting one, you know. And I, and like yeah, and you're talking to um, the trans fella and. And you said it asked about hormones, and another person in the crowd went, "Oh, hormones!" Because yeah. they obviously got triggered because they read something on the internet about kids getting hormones or some shit. Like, you know, yeah, like I was a fucking adult. Like, yeah, shut yeah, the yeah. Fuck up. Exactly. Like, a lot of people need hormones. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, hormones are commonly used through medicine. Yeah, for all sure sorts of they different were reasons. Fucking four years old, getting administered hormones by like a trans person and yeah. kids. 
You know, uh, it was good, man, because you, you, you know, you, you bantered with the couple, mm. and you were real respectful as well, joking and being funny. And then some other guy tried to chime in with his disapproval, and then you roasted him. Yeah. And you know, it was really good, man. Like the way that you handled that. A lot of people, you know, and that's why the crowd loved it too, because. We're in a time where it's hard to talk about a lot of these things. Yeah. And, you know, for people that really don't have any experience hanging around um, people yeah. unlike themselves, really. Yeah. That's what yeah. it comes down to, is people that don't hang out with anyone that's not like them. And they're like, yeah. oh, shit, people are doing things yeah. not like me. Yeah. But you held this space so well and made them feel comfortable, um, brought everyone in onto it, in on it as well. And I think people learn as well. And like, you yeah. know, and I think with people that are transphobic and things like that, it's always the case if they don't know anyone that is, you know. And yeah, for sure. And I hope that guy in the crowd that went, if you listen to him, brother, I hope that situation made you feel a bit more involved and understanding, you know, because it was a good night. Yeah. We all had a good time. I hope they had a good time. Everyone was No, they loved it. it. They came up afterwards and, yeah. and they, they said... Because it's like... I think a lot of a lot of it's definitely harder to make fun of people who are very unlike yourself. Like I'm a I'm a super straight white guy, yeah. you know, and then talking to like a trans man from Palestine yeah, in a in a gay relationship with an American is like yeah. so not my world at all. hundred percent. But but like I think that's where some of the best comedy comes from because yeah. you can understand more from from someone and you can kind of prod at their world from an outsider's point of view. Yeah, yeah. You notice know, this about you. And That's they can it. Go, yeah, but what about this? And if you can joke about it, it, it brings everyone together. Like, if you're just yeah. there asking someone, oh, uh, so you're from where? Oh, mm -hmm. when did you transition? You know yeah. what I mean? But it's cool. You got to learn about it, and so did all the way. Like, when the fella said he was American, mm. and I was like, and realised the dynamic of their relationship, yeah. and they met on, was it My Little Pony or something? They like met that? on, yeah, I'll put the clip out, but I, I they met on a My Little Pony, like, fan website. Yeah, Which yeah. I said was the most trans way to meet anyone. Yeah, sure <laughs> But, like, so much respect to them for them to yeah. meet there from either sides of the world. Yeah. End up married in Australia, mm. and... You know, doing their thing, like, yeah, they're so awesome. I was, I was blown away and, like, got nothing but respect for them because that's that's fucking journey. That's... That's fucking wild. I that's can't overcoming, on that. Yeah, yeah, that's overcoming... I can't believe how many things that's they have overcome to be yeah. where they are now, yeah. loving life, sitting at a comedy show, having a laugh. You know yeah. what I mean? And that's the most beautiful, beautiful shit ever, like... Yeah, I love, I love like... And I, th I think, like... So often people are like, oh, you know, you can't... Like, a lot of a lot of people would say that what I was doing with them was punching down or, like, making fun yeah, of... No, but the so same punching it's... down is putting them below. Yeah, I think that's And that's the lame. thing, man. Like, I see no difference between myself, any person of any race, background, sexuality or gender or identity. Yeah. You know, like, we're all human. And, you know, I'll roast you for being a straight white cunt. And you'll yeah. roast me for fucking me and who I am. And that's the beauty of it. Yeah, that's what they, comedy is. They've come to my show. They can fucking handle it. You know, they, yeah, that's they can, it. If they can fucking do transition as a refugee, I reckon they can take a couple of shots. You know? yeah. Growing up, yeah, as a trans person yeah. in Palestine, I can only imagine the, you know, the struggles yeah. and everything. And so, yeah, so much respect and power to them because that was cool. And it was oh, cool yeah. to watch you facilitate that situation. And yeah, I hope everyone in that room learned more. I it's did, cool. It's you know. cool. I like, um, that's what I'm really enjoying about the crowd work is like, yeah, finding out more about my audience because I never used to talk to them. Mm. I would just do my hour and it, the shows were great, but I would never really delve into the audience because I was not very good at it or I would mm. hurt feelings and I would be a little bit scared as well. Yeah. But doing this has taught me so much about my audience and it's, it's really cool, like, you know, seeing that and also teaching the other people in the audience about like who else is, is yeah, there as well. Like, yeah, it's inclusive. Yeah, like in, in Brisbane I had like this uh, two years in a row I had this big group of like Sudanese girls yeah, come, to, come to the show which I think is so fucking cool. Yeah, because yeah, I mean yeah, a lot of your audience is pretty wide out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For, for a long time my audience was like just straight white boys. Yeah. Um, and I think that was just because I was on, on YouTube and Facebook yeah, which yeah. is a very straight white male hobby but now that I'm on TikTok and Instagram and, and like on podcasts I'm on so many different things and now I guest on stuff my audience has kind of broadened up and awesome. I get 
I think really that my crowd now is like the the one running theme is they're all like individuals. Yeah. Like I have I have weirdos who are like I like what I like and I am who I am. Yeah. And they come to the show, so it's like, okay. you know, they're just like people, which I yeah. guess is you know you kind of get what you put out. I guess that's what I am as well. You are, man. You're hundred percent, bro. You are, have definitely always been the individual that is like I like what I like. I am what I am, and I'm gonna do what I do. Mm. And I've noticed that, especially even when I was touring with you, you had a lot of fellow people that reminded me of you like that. And, mm. you know, as we we all do, we like things that we see ourselves in, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's cool, man. It's very interesting. Yeah, so, yeah, I've got a fuck lot of clips that I'll be just working on editing now, which will, yeah. be, which will be fun to do. Um, what are you working on at the moment? Well, so I just put out a few new songs. Um, so I've mainly been working on music with Denny, my partner, yeah. for the last yeah couple of years since we've been together. But this year's been crazy. So you've been all over. Yeah, yeah. So at the start of the year, we did a bunch of festivals. This was when Corona hit Tassie. Yeah. Um, I got I had to get a fucking jab, and I got it um, on Christmas Eve. <laughs> yeah. And then I saw this fella I knew at the chemist where I got it done. Yeah. And this was still like, if you, this was still when if you had a close encounter, you had to isolate for a week. Yeah. And so I had this, we got booked for this New Year's gig at Mona in um, Tasmania, which yeah. is a big museum and there's heaps of gigs there. And at, at the time, they were allowed to have 1,000 capacity on New Year's Eve night. So yeah. it was the biggest gig in Tasmania that New Year's. Yeah. There was nothing bigger. Yeah. And Denny and I got booked to do the countdown set. So we performed for oh, an yeah. hour before the <coughs> countdown. Yeah. So yeah, we did the best gig in Tassie. We had yeah. the best gig, you know, awesome. the countdown. And that was killer. But um, yeah, so I got the shot and you needed to have the shot to perform at festivals, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And oh, th- two days after, I get a message saying, you've had a close encounter. You need to isolate for a week. And I'm like, I'm performing at Mona in two days on New Year's. Yeah. I'm, I feel fine. I'm not isolating. Yeah. And then, you know, um, and then Denny's like, ah, oh, you know, we're like, should we do it? And I'm like, ah, if I could break the rules, you know, like, yeah. she's going, no, but what if we, you know, and we're just like stressing. And we're like, fuck. And I still was feeling fine. And um, so we're like, we'll drive down there and we'll see what happens. And as we're driving down, they change the laws. Like, okay, it's all good. So we got to do the gig, no worries, uh-huh. you know. Yeah. And um, yeah, it turns out the guy in the chemist that I saw, my mate, got yeah. corona and he was my close encounter. So. Well, now that they've changed the rules again, you can test positive and they go, yeah, just go to work. Yeah, Don't yeah, yeah. It. Fucking hell. What a fucking head fuck. I know. The the arguments, you know, that everyone in the world would have had over that shit with their loved ones and I know. different crazy shit. It's it fucked with us. But um, yeah, after that, it went really good, man. We kept doing more shows at festivals. We did our party in the apocalypse, which is a new festival in Hobart um, and we did that sort of um, mission you know just over the summer I and miss then, Tasmania so much yeah oh, we miss you too bro yeah yeah. yeah. I and would uh, oh, fuck I would love to just move back there like actually yeah <laughs> it's a cool place man and like there's just still experiences down there that you haven't even shared with me yet you know like, well yeah I didn't really get to see too much because I was isolated for so, for so long and then because I was locked away in isolation, and then when I got out, it was straight to touring. So yeah. I was leaving a lot. Yeah, so yeah. I never really had a full week there. Yeah. And then at the end of my tour, I ended up coming back to Melbourne three months earlier. Yeah. So I never really got that few months in Tassie that I For thought sure. I was going to get. Yeah, so at the end of the summer, we were like, what is buggered from being around so many people all the time yeah. and just touring? And, and we really needed a break. Um, so we went to stay with Denny's cousin, who's a fellow called Craig Everett, mm-hmm. and he lives down in the very bottom of Tassie. Um, this tiny little like beach suburb. It's just like a dirt road with maybe like twenty houses on it yeah. and a beach. Yeah, that's it. And we went down there, and Craig is an amazing human. You know, he's Denny's uh, cousin, and he's probably one of the most. Um, active fellas when it comes to practice and culture down there he's a Tasmanian Aboriginal yeah and um yeah he just he lives off the land a lot of the time I he's, see he's always hunting he's always fishing he's always um you know carving different things out of wood 
um, doing all sorts of different stuff. Like the last time we were down there, he was painting egu- emu eggs. He got about 20 emu eggs mm. and blew them all out, cooked up omelets for the whole whole area, and then sat there painting pictures on the eggs. Oh, cool. And um, so, yeah, we just I went down there and started fishing. I've never really fished much in my life. I think once when I was a kid. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we're going out every day, getting like 15 to 20 flatties, um, getting cocky salmons, they're little salmons like this. Yeah. And so we get back, fill up the flatties, deep fry them. Uh, it's a fresh flat head straight out of the water. And the cocky salmons you just put into a breville and just let it cook. And then you just pick the salmon out <laughs> between the bones. That'd be awesome. Yeah. And so, and it's, then we're going along the beach and oysters, man, I'm not kidding, like that big, like wow. two hands, yeah. like oysters, banging them off the rocks with hammers. And then we, we took a little bag of bacon with us and yeah. just see a sauce. And so what we do, we set up a fire on the beach and we cook the oysters, I'd like put some uh, branches over it and sit the oysters on the branches and cook it that way. Uh, take them off, let them cool down. And then we got one big oyster shell and we put heaps of bacon on that and we cooked that, so we cooked the bacon. Yeah. So we're having proper oysters kill Patrick on yeah. the beach. You awesome. know, and the oysters were so good that Danny and I went back into the city a little while later and we went out for dinner at a place called Muir's, which is like yeah. one of the best seafood joints down at the wharf, you know. Yeah. And we got their oysters, man, and we spat them out like snobs. <laughs> and it's like, look, yeah. what's this shit? Like, yeah. And man, like, it's still like Tasmanian prime oysters. It's yeah. better than 99% of the world. <laughs> But they've still been probably frozen for a day or two or something yeah. like that. So compared to these ones, and some of them, man, like, unbelievable. Yeah. So, yeah, and, you know, down there doing that. And um, and I was talking to Craig Everett, and he's a remarkable human, man. He grew up as, you know, an Aboriginal fella in Launceston, Tasmania, um, in the 90s. Wow. So he has been through some of the most hectic shit that I've ever heard. He's dealt with severe fucking racism. He's overcome so There's much. There's a very common belief in Tasmania that there are no uh, Aboriginals in Tasmania yeah, left. which is a, a pretty offensive thing to the mob down there. Yeah. And that's at fault of the government. They've pushed this yeah. lie for um, probably about 150 years. Yeah. It's been... I don't know, it's around 1869, 1870 that they started pushing that lie. Yeah. Um, maybe even 19... It's just them going, treat who better? There's none left, we don't have to do anything. Exactly, yeah. But the thing is, like, yeah. you know, there was um, a few really important people in the community in those times, and this is the, the end of the frontier wars, um, that were really powerful people. There was a woman called um, Fanny Cochran Smith, and she ended up marrying a convict fella, and they had about 14 kids. Mm-hmm. And so this is around... Really living up to her name there. Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then, yeah, the, the government actually realised, because the, yeah. the war's finished in around, like, um, 1830, 1840. Yeah. But then I think it was around 1860, 1870, the government was like, oh, what we did was bad. Mm. So they gave uh, Fanny Cochran Smith about 300 acres of land. Yeah. That's... Down near where Craig is, actually. Craig isn't descended from her. He's descended from Manalagana, who is also um, my partner's grandfather. And he was the chief of the northeast corner of Tasmania. Yeah. Well, son of the chief, sorry. And, um, but yeah, Fanny Cochran Smith, she had uh, 14 kids and she built her own church down there and <coughs> would, was a big leader in the community and she yeah. used to walk from all the way down there up into the town to sell her crafts and stuff like mm-hmm. that and I think she passed away around 1905, if I'm correct. But, um, yeah, so the government pushed, pushed this um, bullshit and there's still people that believe it, yeah. you know, all across the country. My partner and I, Denny, um, have been at... Mox. I feel like I've heard that. Growing up, that yeah, there's yeah. no Aboriginals left in Tasmania. That's the lie that they pushed. Yeah. You know? And this is the thing that uh, white Australia, Australia doesn't understand. They think the term Aboriginal means that you are, you know, very dark. Yeah. Their token idea of Aboriginal is. Yeah. But 
you know, Aboriginal people and people that are descended from Aboriginal people are Aboriginal. Yeah. You are always, if you are descended from Aboriginal people, you are Aboriginal. And they are still Aboriginal people in so many ways, even if their skin is white. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting genes and genetics and things that come back. Like, like I found out that I've got a um, fifth great grandmother that's Native American. Yeah. And she's from a a tribe called Penobscot and they're from the northeast corner of America mainly around Maine um, mm. New Hampshire and even in Nova Scotia in the bottom bit of Canada yeah and um, yeah it was interesting uh, and I found a picture of my great grandmother in America and as soon as I saw her and I found this picture and she was descended from this lady from a reservation there called Indian Island yeah um and yeah, I looked at this photo, I was like, she's Native American, you know? Mm. But I've never looked at any of my family down here and, and known anything about it, you know, yeah. or, or really thought that. So it's so interesting in so many ways. But back to Craig. So Craig is like, um, yeah, he grew up in Launceston and he grew up around, you know, a lot of crime in that area. It's very rough. He went through a lot and, you know, he became a hardened individual. But... Um, uh, he, he ended up refinding his culture through meeting a lot of mob and he travelled out around the country and he he went out into the um, Simpson Desert with fellas and learned all this traditional mm. practice and process and because there's, there's so much... <clears throat> um, their culture is so deep. I can't even be, begin to understand it. What's one of the oldest cultures, if not the oldest culture on the planet? It is the oldest proven culture on the planet. And yeah. I think that's due to a lot, a lot to do with the isolation. Yeah. But, um, and, and it's crazy how much white, Australia, white Australia really doesn't understand the depths of their knowledge. Yeah. You know, and I still only just am starting to understand aspects of it, you know. Yeah. And I, I'm a white fella, I don't know if I ever will. But I'm so open to learn and very grateful for the people that have shared with me. And, um, yeah, so as we're hanging out with Craig, Craig's telling me his story. And I was just, like, getting goosebumps. I was like, this guy's had a crazy life. Like, he, when he was at school, the school was like, you're not Aboriginal. And, like, yeah. would scream, and he'd stand up and be like, I know who my father is. Like, you can't tell me yeah. that I'm not, you know? And... Um, and as he'd tell me these stories, I was like, man, you need to write a song about it. You should yeah. make a song with your cousin Denny, you know? And, yeah. and he's like, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> he was just like, fuck off. Because yeah. I don't rap. He, goes, he dances, he does traditional cultural dancing, and he sings in language and speaks in language. And, um, but yeah, he's like, I don't rap. And I was like, okay, bro, okay. And, you know, as the time went on, and he'd tell me these stories and they stick in my head and I'd be thinking about it for a day or two and I, so I'd write down some of his quotes on a yeah. notepad. And then after a couple of weeks... Did you put fuck off in there? Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't. But I put a couple other ones in there. Yeah. Like, and, you know, just and a big part of Craig, when he went over to the mainland and learned all this culture, he brought it back and taught the rest of the community. Yeah. And the community that, that had lost a lot of this culture. There was quite a few people in the mob that have gone to different places and learned stuff and brought it back and it strengthened the community to start practising this culture that they were like cut off from you know for yeah, hundreds of years that's and what's like so i find really interesting about aboriginal people in australia is because a lot of it's to, it's not written down yeah so they have to if they want to learn it or relearn it they literally have to go and talk to someone who knows it and then bring it back and teach everyone about yeah. it because that's not something that happens in many cultures at all oh no but it does it does like for example like I met this Maori fella, and his name's Phil Dave. He actually egged the Queen in 1987. You told me about this. Yeah, he's a unit. Um, and he's got a crazy story, man. But he knew his lineage back past the year 900. Yeah. And I think it was 936 when his tribe came to New Zealand from a different island. Mm. And he knew all of this through oral tradition. Wow. You know, like, and... I think it is Western culture that started really like, let's document fucking everything, you know. And yeah, if it's not written down, it wasn't real. Yeah, exactly. Whereas, you know, so much is still being passed around. Do you know what songlines mean? No. 
Oh, so, maybe. Yeah, so there's song lines and, and things like that, and that is like certain songs that have been passed along and you can follow song lines up through the country, if you know what yeah. I mean. And, and that's where a lot of their stories and different things get passed along and dances and, and um, that's how a lot of the culture works. You know, so, yeah, as I'm sitting with Craig and learning and just blowing out and I was like, man, you've got to write a song about this. And he was like, no. And then after a couple of weeks, I had about, I don't know, 20 different quotes in my yeah. notes. And I, I was like, hey, Nita, because Nita is uh, their word for brother. Yeah. Yeah. And so their language is Palawakani. And Palawa means Tasmanian Aboriginal, and Kani means speech. So yeah. Palawa Kani, yeah. And um, there's fuckloads of Aboriginal languages. Yeah, in heaps. Australia. Yeah, yeah. Like, so many different ones, and there's so many nations. You know, there's so many mobs in different nations. If you ever look at a Aboriginal map of Australia, yeah. you blow out because it's yeah. a million colours. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> it's with these big fucking square lines. Well, Queensland. Be, you know, it should like, be like. It's fucking weird that a country this big has like five places. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah, like, yeah. you look at America. 100%. You know, they got 50 plus states. That yeah. makes more sense for us. Yeah. You know, and that's what the Aboriginals had. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And theirs was based off land. Yeah. You know, areas and different stuff like that. And so I said, hey, Nita, have a look at these notes. And I passed him the phone. And um, he's looked at me and he's like, wide eye giving me this serious look and he's gone that's my fucking life yeah that's my story yeah and I, it was always be like yeah that's well, gonna go you know yeah. and i was like i know you need to you need to speak it on this song and cement your legacy because he's yeah i was like man this you are so powerful as a person and he's such a leader for so many people and i see him sharing this energy i watched him reconnect with an aboriginal fellow i grew up with who didn't know anything and this guy really struggled throughout his life, he ended up in jail and stuff like that. Yeah. And he met Craig and Craig taught him how to dance and opened him up and let him experience his culture again. And my mate's now having a child, working full time, he's turned his whole life around. Cool. He's learning language. He's so excited yeah. every day to try and speak in language. And yeah. you know, he's, oh, what does this mean? And it's given him such a purpose that he was lost yeah. You know, when I was growing up with him, he was fucking smashing cunts out in the street. Yeah. He was a unit. He's a mad cunt, and he can fucking fight like a champion. And, um, yeah, he was just getting him caught up in so much different shit. And then, yeah, this is... It's, it's helped him find who he is. And watching Craig do this for people, yeah, just inspired me to, to help him capture his story in something that, you know, could be shown to the world. That's great. Yeah, and so... It started off with, um, I got my phone and we recorded him playing didgeridoo, mm. recorded him clapping the sticks and um, uh, hitting the, the grass yeah. and all sorts of different natural sounds from inside his house because yeah. he's got everything in his house. You know? yeah. He's got a little like bark, a little um, hut at the front with the fire and he yeah. sleeps under there half the time in the front yard. He loves it. And... Um, so we recorded it all and we sent it to my mate Larrikin, who's a, a, one of the best producers in Australia. Uh, he's in Adelaide. And so he got all the sounds and put together this beat. Sick. Yeah, and um, we got the beat back. And, you know, I just pretty much helped Craig get his quotes and just organise them and structure them so they rhyme in a flowing sort of way. Yeah. And uh, Denny wrote a verse and, you know, they put together the chorus and recorded this song called Strongest Mob to let... Yeah. The rest of the country know that they are still there. They are still yeah. practicing culture. They are still, you know, they're standing up against this lie the fucking government has been pushing for 200 years now. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so... Which we, is huge for Tasmania. Massive. And um, especially for the mob down there. And, you know, Luchawida. Luchawida is the name, the Aboriginal name for Tasmania. Mm. Yeah, and so, you know, and educating people about it because... So many mob down there that have grown up disconnected don't even know any of that. You know? yeah. So it's been so important for the community down there. But um, so for the video clip, we went out tuna fishing. And it's we a had, sick clip. It's a good video clip. Watch it. Strongest mob. It's a fucking yeah. cool video clip. So Denny, strongest mob featuring Craig Everett. And before we went out tuna fishing, have you yeah. ever been tuna fishing? No. So that's on the boat out in the ocean with the big <laughs> rods. Yeah. And you'd be there and all of a sudden. <laughs> And you have to get on and stick it into this... Yeah, because they're huge. Yes, yeah, this weird harness with this, like, 
little hole there that looks like a little weird dick yeah. and you fucking put the pole where your dick is and you have to fall fight it for like 15 years and like pull it back and then we're all in and then back and, yeah. then, oh, and then yeah pulling in like 30, 40 kilo tunas wow. and we caught we caught like five of them. <laughs> That's fucking ridiculous. Yeah, and albacore. Albacore is one of the best fishes in the world. Yeah. I've never had it before, but if you chop it up and make nuggets and deep fry it, <laughs> ridiculous. It's like chicken. It's amazing. And so, yeah, we caught like these big five fish, and then we on the weekend we organised for a lot of the community to come down to the beach. And on a Saturday, Denny and Craig, um, yeah, culturally all oaked up and and did some dances and sort of presentations. And then on the Sunday, we just had a big barbecue. And that's where they're putting body paint on. Yes, yeah, yeah. so, body yeah, body paint's called, yeah. well, it's called ochre. Yeah. So they get it from certain parts of the ground. Yeah. And um, there's different colors of ochre. There's like yeah. white, um, red, yellow, yeah, there's even purple ochre. There's yeah, all sorts cool. of different stuff. So, yeah, and they get that out of the ground, dry it up, crush it up, and then put it on. Yeah. And so, yeah, they all woke it up and they were doing the mutton bird dance. And the mutton birds are a, a type of bird that's you only really find on the east coast of Tasmania and maybe the west coast of New Zealand. Yeah. And they migrate halfway across the world and back. And the mob down there have been eating mutton bird for yeah. forever. And especially after the, the frontier wars, um, the mob was sent to live on these islands off the northeast coast of Tassie and it was the mutton birds that really kept them going because they actually have the highest ocean omega oil in their oil yeah. in the world so they're really good for you yeah right it's like taking yeah like whenever I eat mutton bird fish oil tablets but like times a million yeah yeah like if I'm a big crook, they make like sports balm out of it down there yeah and you put that on your chest under your nose and on your temples and feet It'll kill the flu by the morning. You're just like, oh, sweet, no worries. Wow. And um, so, yeah, they're doing mutton bird dances and everything like that. It was really powerful. And then, so that was on the Saturday. And then the Sunday, um, the whole community came down. We cooked up all the tuna, big tuna steaks, um, buckets and buckets of mussels that we got off the boats and we're just cooking up in the fire. And and we filmed again another few shots. We got all the kids dancing and... You know, it was beautiful, man. It was honestly, like, one of my favourite weekends I've ever had in my life. Just for the mob and be a part of that community and just be so honoured. You're very lucky to be welcomed into that. It's beautiful, man. And I think this is a big pro- another big problem with white Australia is they think that they're not welcomed. And sometimes they're not. But, you know, like... Um, yeah, I've got another little topic on that in a second. But So when we released this video... It kicked right off, especially in the yeah. Aboriginal community in Australia. And because there are so much mob on the mainland that believe the lie that, you know, that yeah. the government pushes and don't know anything about the culture yeah. or the community down there. And um, so that video led to some massive opportunities for Denny. And she all of a sudden got booked for a big street festival in Parramatta. And yeah. so myself and Craig went up with her to um, perform alongside Briggs and JK47. Oh, so he went and performed too. Craig did. Yeah, Craig. That would be his first performance. <coughs> Craig's oh. first time on stage. Well, he, Craig's, he danced, did traditional dancing in the Sydney Opera House. So yeah. he's performed. Oh, so he's at least been in front of an audience before. He's massive. Yeah. yeah, he's opened up Gordon Ramsay. Oh, cool. Yeah, cool. when Gordon Ramsay came to Tasmania. Awesome. Yeah, and Craig ate some of his food and went, that's shit, can't. <laughs> <laughs> He goes, I cook better, I cook that better than You can't be out here and try and cook my local food. No. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's footage of it on YouTube, actually. But, um, yeah, so that first time Craig ever rapped on stage was with us at a street wow. festival in um, Parramatta, opening up for Briggs, you know. Oh, and cool. That was really cool. And... Um, Denny and Craig made a little dance up for it and there was a massive dance academy there, Aboriginal Dance Academy, and they've all learned the dance and cool. it was a vibe. And um, and then that led to yeah, more opportunities and then we got invited to Kalkarinji. So Kalkarinji is a town that's about eleven hours drive southwest of Darwin. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's not it's kind of closer to the WA border yeah. than it is Darwin. And um, Kalkarinji is well known for um, it was the first place that kind of birthed land rights in Australia where the Australian government 
started giving land parcels back to the Aboriginal community. Yeah. And so this happened um, in the 60s that um, the mob that were living there, they were working on a cattle station and they were only getting paid 3% yeah. of what white people were getting paid. Yes. Yeah, so they had enough being treated like shit and all this sort of stuff and they went on protest for nine years. Nine years. Uh, yeah. Fuck, that, that's a protest. That's a protest. And they walked up and they sat by a river for nine years apparently and eventually the Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam, decided to go up there and say, what's, what's going on? And um, Vincent Langari was the name of the, the fella up there and he said, we want our land back, you know. And yeah. Gough Whitlam picked up some dirt and poured it in his hand and that kicked off the land rights in Australia. So it's a very important place yeah. to the mob. And, um, yeah, Paul Kelly wrote the song from Big Things, uh, from Little Things, Big Things Grow, about that town. Yeah. And every year on the anniversary of um, the Wayfield World Walk Off, they have the Freedom Day Festival where they celebrate, you know. And so, yeah, Denny was invited there. And um, I was very lucky enough to go up there with her. And this is, yeah, proper red dirt out in the middle of nowhere, yeah. you know, country. And. It was confronting getting there at first because it's like, yeah, we just don't know that. And it's such a blowout that we've grown up in their country and we don't know that experience, you yeah. know? We've lived here our whole lives and still haven't, until the age of 33, hadn't been out to a red dirt community like Most that. Most people don't, don't know anything and we're not really taught much. I think yeah. I had it pretty good in the sense that I we had a school excursion once where we went to, like, a museum that had an exhibit about indigenous culture and they taught us yeah. about their beliefs and their dances and yeah. instruments and, and yeah. stuff like that. We had a whole day on it. And then we had, I think we had like a week in history teaching us about all the horrible shit we did to them. Yeah. But that's that's kind of it. And I feel like that's really good in comparison to a lot of other things. Because yeah. I remember my dad, my dad told me that when he was a kid, when he was like 13 or 14, they had uh, indigenous week where they learned uh, stuff about Aboriginal people and uh, they didn't learn much about, you know, slavery and horrible things that the government did to them. They just learned a little bit about their culture and their dances and then on the final day to celebrate Indigenous culture, all the kids dressed up as an Aboriginal person yes. and the whole school showed up in blackface. What the fuck? To do the Aboriginal dances. <laughs> And he wow. was, that's my dad. And, yeah, when, yeah. and he was a kid, so he's still what know any better. Them to do. Yeah, of course. And yeah. a whole school of people who have never met or seen an Aboriginal person with yeah. their eyes. Yeah, like yeah. doing blackface at school and dance. wearing like woolly wigs and doing what the fuck? dances taught to them by white teachers. That's so fucked. And that was how they learned about Aboriginal culture. Wow, that's hectic. So yeah, yours is definitely an improvement. <laughs> yeah, a little but bit, like, a little bit better. <laughs> thing, like, why doesn't schools take classes yeah. out on country to meet local mob? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, they might tell you that, but I guarantee they didn't tell you. I mean, I know things are changing now. The things are changing more than ever. And there's still a lot that needs to be done because it needs to be done without tokenism. And this, the other side of it is that, you know, people are trying to tokenise shit. And, you know, as a person that is white on this country, and it's, it's interesting because I've met fellas that say, you know, we want to share our culture and we think with you living on our country, you should respect it and learn it. Yeah. But there's definitely other people that don't want to share their culture, and rightfully so, especially when there is so much trauma with the mob of people misusing and abusing yeah. their culture, yeah. you know. So it's an interesting one. But I think if I'm, yeah, a white fella in this country, I definitely need to learn and be aware and respectful as much as possible about learning this knowledge and, and also sharing it. And I think it is a bit of my responsibility... Um, because I wasn't born in this country, you know, I was born in America, but it's where my heart is. Yeah. And one thing I've learned through being accepted into the mob more is learn more about the country rather than the country. Yeah. Because that's the difference. Yes. Like, that's what I'm, I don't know if you hear the term on country much. Do you ever hear that term? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, a little bit. Mostly little bit? from you. From me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. that's it. There's, that's the difference between the idea of a country, yeah. which is the border, 
of Australia. Yeah, the rules we've written down. Basically, the the government yeah. essentially is what is well, what yeah, country, country is. is like. yeah. These are the these are the states, and within the states, there are the cities, and these are the yeah. laws. That's pretty much what a country is for yeah. most people. Is like the 100%. laws of the culture and the territories, and it's completely separated from the land. Yes, it's all like yeah. social construct yeah. shit. You it's know what the I mean? actual country it's the land country. that you're on and yeah. that's it where the, they are connected with the country they belong to the country you yeah. know and uh, it's it's beautiful but yeah so going up to Kalkarinji when well, we first we you know if it, like simple shit that we just didn't really learn from Aboriginal people for ages is like there were there weren't many catastrophic bushfires until we set up Bro, you know civilization. You know when and two- stop looking after the for the the forests and the trees and shit. By yeah, not doing backburning. And stuff. Yeah, man. do you know how the, the two-headed Tasmanian thing came from? No, is because there's a certain I think it might be iodine or so, iodine or something like that that wasn't in the the fresh water down in Tassie. Yeah. So the mob down there for thousands of years would chew a bit of kelp because they get that from the kelp. You know what I mean? Uh, and they just chew kelp and spit it out or something like that, from what I've been told. And, um, yeah, because there was no iodine in the fresh water. And then all the white cunts rock up and start drinking the fresh water because they're fucking dumb white cunts. They started getting goiters in their necks. And so these big lumps uh, uh, in their necks were growing because they weren't getting any of this iodine or what they needed. Well, and so... Like and then, so there's a whole generation of elderly Tasmanians that have scars on their necks from getting these removed. Oh. And that, mixed with the old inbred story, is the whole two-headed Tasmanian thing. Because they did have scars. Because they didn't listen to Aboriginal Yeah, people. but it was because they didn't listen or learn from wow. the Aboriginal people. They could have avoided that one completely. Yeah. Fuck well, <laughs> even that's why... Uh over in California why their bushfires why their fires are so bad yeah they don't listen all to their the trees are Australian oh you true know that? We, I they, did know that actually they got a bunch of our trees and then put them all in California and in Los Angeles and shit yeah and but they you know didn't consider that those trees actually need fire mm. to maintain themselves and to grow and to get rid of the foliage and if you don't light a fire yourself one will happen at yeah. the worst time and that's why they have those crazy big fires 100%. and that's why we do as well because you know we don't burn trees like indigenous peoples used well, to there was a writing f- from a, one of the colonisers when they got to Tassie yeah. and they said when they first arrived you, they reckon you could ride a horse from top to bottom on short grass they reckon the whole place was completely wow. looked after and manicured. It wasn't overgrown. It was like, because the mob, for that... They like, mowed the state. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look at man. Like, when the land bridge fell, that was about 12, 13,000 years ago. So yeah. the Tasmanian mob... Because Tassie wasn't always an island. No, no. It was a yeah. part of the rest of Australia. And that's... Um, like, Tassie tigers, you've heard of ta- that are extinct now, they're originally from the Pilbara Desert. So, Where's that? So that's way up top. Like, ah. Yeah, up in the middle of Australia sort of area. Yeah. Well, there is there is old traditional paintings of Pilbara tigers yeah. um, in caves up yeah. in the Pilbara Desert. So they would have had to have seen them. Yeah, so they were up there. And as far as I know the story goes, the actual dingoes, because I think dingoes kind of came down from Malaysia. And yeah. they were traded. Because a lot of the mob up top used to trade with yes. not Malaysia, but a lot of... Um, the Asian countries there. Might have been Malaysia. I'm not 100% sure on that one. But dingoes came down through that way. And because dingoes were pack animals, whereas the tigers were like lone wolf hunters, the dingoes actually started taking them out. Yeah. And so they got pushed all the way down to where Tassie is. And this is where the land bridge was still there. And, yeah, I think the story goes that a lot of the mob were sent down to look after the tiger and protect them. Yeah. And... Yeah, then they were on that island for 12,000 years. So, of course, they knew how to keep the grass short and they looked after the tigers. So when that, And I think that's a big part of why the tigers were so easy to hunt. They were really docile creatures that yeah. were comfortable with humans. So yeah. when the fucking colonisers rocked up, they just wiped them out. Yeah. Because also they'd eat sheep and shit, you know, yeah. which is fucking tragic. But, um, yeah, so in Kalkarinji, back to there... 
Um, so we get there, and we're in this community, we're like, wow, this is crazy, and we got there at night time. It'd be hot as fuck, wouldn't it? It was pretty hot, but it wasn't, like, unbearable. Yeah. Actually, it was pretty unbearable at times, but it wasn't humid. Yeah, that's yeah, the worst, when, yeah. it's, when it's hot and humid. That's it, and there was, you know, flies you know, doing these ones, and yeah. you had to deal with it, but... Um, and we, we got there and there was this big kind of screen set up and they were showing us a doco about the history and everything like that. So it was cool. As soon as we got there, we started learning about the history and yeah. about what the weekend was about. And then the next morning, um, two, two old uh, elders came out and they did a welcome. And these two elder women, like, their dads were a part of the original walk-off. Yeah. And they were there when they were kids. So they were there through this whole... Wow. time you know and they'd lived that experience and they literally said thank you for everyone for coming white black it doesn't matter we are one yeah we are celebrating this today you know as one people that's cool and it's about equality yeah you know and seeing this too and like i was there the whole weekend we did workshops with kids on the sunday we're running around with kids having yeah. getting into beatbox and fucking rap and it was sick it was just like no, no mobile phones. Oh man, it was beautiful, and yeah. um, and everyone was so welcoming. No one person was rude to me. Yeah. People have been more rude in Melbourne City for the last three days than anyone was <laughs> ever rude to me in Kalkalindji. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So um, yeah, we got to watch Paul Kelly play, and after he did that Sick. song, fireworks went off, and like yeah, there's about five thousand people there, and I was just like maybe one of the hundred white people there. You know. Wow. And so it was amazing. It was a beautiful experience. And I recommend everyone in Australia to try and get up there and get amongst it. You know? come back with a tan too. Yeah, we definitely. <laughs> got, I got burned as fuck. When yeah. I was, cause we did the reenactment. Yeah, really not built for that environment. Well, that's how we know, it. <laughs> that's how we know that this is in our country. <laughs> Sunburns. Yeah, the you country know, will let you know. Exactly. No, you let's do it. The the and they're like, what the fuck is sunburn? You're not meant to be here, cunts. <laughs> You're not meant to be here. You know what I mean? And, yeah. But um, luckily, I got, I got, when we were doing the reenactment of the walks, they do a reenactment where they walk from the main part of the town all the way up to the river where yeah. all the fellas sat. And um, in the reenactment, I got burnt. Yeah. But like, luckily, in this town, they had about eight wheelie bins with just pure aloe vera growing out of it. <laughs> Dead set. So I was just like grabbing like yeah. big long curly things of aloe vera and peeling it open and just like, oh. Yeah. And that worked so good, man. Yeah. I woke up the next day, still burnt but not hurting. Yes. You know? And um, yeah, it was an amazing experience. And we, we stayed in, after we left there, we went up to Darwin and we stayed with a couple that are both very established musicians, absolute legends. Um, have you ever, do you remember TZ Duke? The old Aussie hip hop crew. Yeah. But yeah, Kuya James, he was a drummer from there and he's also an amazing producer. He works with heaps of different artists around the country and his partner Katie Baker. So we stayed there for a week. We ended up making like four songs in the week because they had a studio there. Yeah. And I went up and met with this fella, Riley P. And Riley is like a, he's about 25, a young rapper in Darwin. He's good mates of rates and yeah. other fellas. And he works full time in Dondale Detention Centre, yeah. which is the worst. <coughs> probably the worst youth detention centre in the country. Yeah. And they've, all, they've had all sorts of human right violations. There was a picture of a fellow called Dylan Voller yeah. where he was strapped to a chair with a bag put over his head that got out and that started a lot. Yes, we're, we're all like a lot of the, the Australian Black Lives Matter yeah. like stuff came from was shit that happened in that prison. Yeah, for sure. The original kids. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And so Riley works in there full time and he's showing me, and he's teaching these kids to rap and helping them do video clips inside Donda. Sick. So he's showing me drill video clips yeah. from inside this detention centre. Yeah. It was hectic. That's hard. And amazing, because some of them were scary. <laughs> So, yeah, they were. They, the kids I are, believe you. The kids are rapping about hectic shit. Yeah. And some of them were beautiful. And yeah. they were kids rapping about wanting to change their life. Yeah. And wanting to be there for their little brothers and sisters. And um, it was so inspiring to me, you know. And then we, we did a song with him and we went and filmed a video clip in the city. And he went and got heaps of the kids that he'd worked with that have got now to come be in the video. So I met some of the kids that I've seen in the video clips. Cool. And we got them in our video clip and they were, they were stoked and that was really cool. 
And so, yeah, that was um, the experience up there, man. And then, yeah, we've come back and we went to Newcastle and yeah. for a street art festival with a guy called Tons. And um, yeah, we, we missed each other by a day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you did a yeah. gig like the day after I left, I think. Yeah. But Newcastle's awesome, man. I love it up there. Yeah, their comedy club there's fucking <coughs> sick. Newcastle Comedy Club, it's sick. Cute. Such a good room. I'll yeah. definitely, definitely go back there. It's really, really cool. I need to give it a crack. Yeah. Do you have to? Do you have to know someone to get your name in there? I don't do think they have so. regular nights. Like... Yeah, they have. They have. I think it's just started. It's really small. I yeah. think they do. Call, I think it's only open three nights a week. But I was talking to the owners. They they reckon they sell it out every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night. They're looking Sick. to add extra nights and stuff. So give up. Seems like it's going really well. Because when it first opened, I was like, oh, I wonder how that's going to go. Like yeah. in a small, like a comedy club in a smaller regional Australian yeah. town is like, fuck. How are you going to get people through the door? And, and is there even enough like comedians to fill the at nights? But that, it sounds like it's going really well. Awesome. Man. Which is great. Okay, well, next time we go to Newey, I'll definitely put my name down. Because after performing with you the, the other night, man, I get so much of a buzz off comedy. It's sick. I love just being able to sit on stage and just yarn. You know? No, I think, I think it's, you're, you're very good at it. You Thank you, bro. Such a, such a different perspective than every other comedian that, yeah. that I hear. It's like the, someone from your work, walk of life doesn't, generally doesn't even consider comedy could be an option. Yeah, yeah. So when you go up there and you talk, just talk about you know, shit you've noticed about living your life, people are like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, true. It blows me out, man. Because I think, you know, like everyone, I guess, thinks they're normal. <laughs> yes, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so when I'm telling those stories and I see people's reactions, I'm like, oh, shit, you don't know this sort of shit. You know? like, oh, yeah, like that's why, because I, for... The, this big YouTube group, The Misfits, they did a video where that'll be coming out at some point where they try stand up comedy. So they got me in to kind of teach them yeah, right. how to write a joke. And, like, you know, the number one thing I kept t- telling them was like, your life is so normal to you, but it's not to any anyone else because yeah. they're not you. So, like, you know, one of them's trans, and it's like, I'm sure that's like an everyday, normal, boring thing for you, but like, for someone who's not trans, like, what the fuck yeah. is that like? 100%. One yeah. of them's American. It's like, what is it like to be American in Australia? You know? Yeah. Like, your life is, people think that their life is so boring because, you know, maybe it is kind of boring to you. Yeah, or yeah. it's normal to you, but like, to someone else, there's something fucking very interesting about every person's life. Exactly. I haven't lived it. Yeah, 100%. That's cool, man. Yeah, that's mine. Yeah. Um, I, I, sh- I should uh, probably wrap this up soon, but I'll tell you about... Um, I've got a video coming out that I wanted to tell you about that I think is very, very funny. Yeah, go for it, bro. Uh, when I was in Sydney, I've had this video idea for ages. I wanted to do a video, like, with a really big... Uh, like, just a very big OnlyFans creator. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to do, like, a day in the life of an OnlyFans girl... But I, I didn't know anyone, or I knew some girls who did it, but they weren't big. I wanted like yeah. a, a really big one. And, uh, uh, Barbie shit. Yeah, yeah, like someone yeah. who's because you know the the worst would be to 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 do one with a girl and it's just really sad, you know. Yeah. Like I do all this. Like, how much money do you make? Oh, well, I still work <laughs> at a job. You know, it's just sad. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I wanted I wanted someone who's like doing well and yeah. is not going to quit. For sure. You know. So uh, anyway, this one massive girl called uh, Dainty Wilder followed me who I hadn't heard of and I look her up and she's huge like one of the biggest in the world yeah cool so I reached out to her and, and she's like yeah let's let's fucking do it I pitched her the idea she goes absolutely let's do it and we we go over to her place in Sydney and uh you know f- film like do like a whole house tour and she lives in this beautiful insane house and, yeah you know she talks about what she does we did a podcast with her as, as well which will which will be really good I think it'll come out maybe like a few weeks or so yeah cool and then she takes us through the house and shows us like her editing her own porn and stuff like that and yeah. then takes us to another room and it's like oh this is my sex toy room and it's like a room Clock it out. there's like fuck machines on the floor and Jesus and there's like a like a life size man torso with a huge dick yeah and, <laughs> yeah, and, and like a, and then like a double ended fuck machine yeah. thing and then she opens up like like this walk-in wardrobe full of lingerie and then drawers full of dildos and butt plugs and all this kind of stuff. How many do you need? Heaps, apparently. Heaps. If you want to be one of the goats. Yeah, right. <laughs> you need heaps. She's, she's showing me, I pick up one and I go, this is 
fucking huge. He goes, oh, I could deep throat that. I was like, all right. What? <laughs> and, you what? know, she's, like, super open. It was yeah, actually yeah, yeah. really, really good. Yeah, it's cool, man. Um, and Blows my head. I was like, all right, then. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then she's like, uh, anyway, I'm going to film a scene. Do you want to watch? Wow. And, and we're like, yeah, all right. And she does a whole fucking scene in front of us, a solo thing. We film it for the video. It's going to be very, like, Louis Thoreau, fly on the wall. Fully. Yeah, that's what I, I was thinking of, like, oh, yeah. poor Louis in the fucking gay porno. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's, it's very much uh, <coughs> like that. I think it's going to be a fucking great video. I'm just going to... It's going to be very difficult to edit for YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> There'll be a Patreon version. Yeah. But even then, like, this shit that we... Because she's full of, like a proper actual solo scene yeah. that we filmed that she filmed that she posted the video to her OnlyFans so it's porn that she shot yeah, yeah, so I'm yeah. trying to figure out like how the fuck do I edit this That's for it. YouTube might have to just completely remove it but then yeah. even on Patreon I was like fuck am I gonna has Patreon have any rules with you can have nudity yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I'm gonna have to actually look at the rules around yeah. it for Patreon That's um, hectic, but that. OnlyFans is a weird thing man like I've never really looked into it as, you know, not my cup of tea, to be honest. But I know I've got friends that have done it. And, yeah. You know, each of their own. Your hustle's your hustle. and something I couldn't personally do. It's but interesting. I, 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 we get out, like, about some of these people that... Not people that just do only fans. Like, if, you know, porn's your thing, do your thing, you know, whatever. Yeah. But I blow out at some of these <coughs> entertainers and celebrities that have a target audience yes. of teenagers and they're making pretty immature content. Yeah, I they're don't like that. Like aimed at kids and they're like, yes. and we do OnlyFans. Yeah. It's fucking weird to me. I, can't, I see it kind of as grooming. Yeah, because this girl I mean? she like, only does sex stuff. That's, yeah, her, that's yeah. her thing. That's fine. Because that's like, I'm an adult entertainer. Yeah, cool. For sure. But there's so many like vloggers on TikTok that do like daily vlogs. Yeah. And they're... they're wholesome, fun, you know, entertaining videos of them living this beautiful money lifestyle mm. and you can't mention sex work at all on TikTok. So they they don't even allude to it. Yeah, right. And there's like this one girl, you know, she's, uh, I think her name is uh, Anna Paul, right? She does this, you know, kid-friendly vlogs, right? That yeah. are very entertaining and funny, doesn't swear, nothing. They're not sexy at all. They're just like, here's my amazing life traveling here and buying this and doing that yeah. and I one day I look her up on Twitter and her tits are out what? she's got OnlyFans and that's where she's making all her money from yeah, yeah. and yes it's interesting where it's like she has this audience and if you look at the comment section it's all kids yeah, but then yeah. she does porn it's yeah. like it's like if the Wiggles fucked people on OnlyFans yeah fans. yeah it's, which I don't I don't think I like it's weird no, it's, it's, no, it's interesting it's a crazy world because the hustle is a it's above morals in a lot of the world now. It's like, nah, get your thing, do your hustle. And, like, I, I believe anyone is completely entitled to empower themselves in any way, so long as it doesn't hurt anyone else, you know? Yeah. Like, um, I definitely, you know, I don't have anything against anyone doing their thing. But I me personally, just, like... Just a, I think that it's a very rare person that genuinely enjoys it like what talking yeah. to this dating girl loves it yeah, right yeah, I, yeah. I talked to her and I you know off camera I got I got a real sense that like she loved what she did yeah, awesome. and she was really good at it she was proud of being good at it I'm like okay awesome that's the type of person should be doing this but yeah. you know I, I, I asked her the question that I always think about this with OnlyFans stuff or sex work in general where it's like for every YouTuber like me or every comedian like me there's probably thousands of people who try it and don't make it 100%. they don't make any money or they 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 do it and they're good at it but they never replace their income yeah same is true of only fans yeah, but yeah. if you start a youtube channel and never make it the consequences for that Way is less. you have a, an embarrassing youtube channel that yeah, no one watches or maybe sure. it's good and no one watches it so it's a fun little hobby that you have that have no repercussions whatsoever in yeah. your life if you start an only fans and you don't make it because you didn't work hard enough or you or you were unlucky or you weren't the right type of body to get enough people mm. You're fucked. Yeah. And the consequences for that are everlasting. Of like, you're the person that you're, yeah. you're a sex worker online, but you never were able to replace your income. Mm. So you have to live in this weird 
double life where you have the consequences of being a sex worker yeah. and how that affects your reputation and ability to move forward in the normal world, but you don't have the benefits of being a sex worker, which is heaps of money. Yeah. There's a chick I, I knew growing up. It's like high, very high stakes if yeah, you start yeah. that. There's a chick I knew growing up. I don't really like her at all. I've never have, so I don't really mind if I can... <laughs> and that's what this show's all about. She's a flop. Yeah. And, um... Yeah, she was doing... I know, she's probably doing OnlyFans now. Fuck knows. Yeah. I haven't, yeah, paid attention in years. But I know through one of my other friends' kids that went to school with her daughter... Yeah. Um, ...that... She was doing like new photography and this is what I mean and posting it on Facebook. That's what I mean. If you don't like make it money, you're you're gonna everyone's gonna know. Yeah, like you should know that. Yeah, yeah. You right. found out from your her friends, whatever the fuck. Hundred percent. And her poor daughter was yeah. just copping it from because yeah. this woman's not attractive either. She's just delusional, you know. <laughs> She's narcissistic and delusional. <laughs> Yeah. And her poor kid, who's actually a legend of a kid, yeah. fucking cops it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and from the whole school to the point where she had to change schools and all this sort of shit. Yeah. And still the mum was like, I don't care. I'm getting mine. You know what I mean? And like... Yeah, I don't know about doing it when you have children. Yeah. Or, you know, you will have children one day. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I remember being a kid and someone's like oh that's so and so's mum she was in old, the, the home section on picture mag which there yeah. used to be like a section where um home girls yeah do you remember that shit no and I was it was a zoo zoo magazine zoo. yeah I swear it was zoo that they have a section it was just like send in your own yeah sort of deal yeah. yeah and um yeah it was not good for anyone so you know I do feel for like the people that are negatively affected by this industry by seeing people they care about have delusions of grandeur I think and end up thing, just yeah. shaming themselves and their community. Yeah. And that's it, the real dangerous you know, thing about this OnlyFans thing is that same as YouTube, you only see the winners. Yeah. You and don't, if someone's not making a fuckload of money on OnlyFans or if someone's not getting any views on YouTube, you don't see their videos because you don't see their videos. 100%. And for every fucking millionaire that I talk to and I do a video on, there's going to be thousands of bitches that never make it. Oh, 100%. But the and also, is so much worse. I live in a small town where everyone knows each yeah. other's business anyway. Yeah. Like, not everywhere is Sydney or Melbourne where you can just disappear into any apartment anywhere you yeah. know it's it's um it's weird and there's creeps out there too i get worried about that like i feel that it somewhat can create dangerous situations yeah. only fans is very inviting to predators and fucking evil cunts out there that want yeah, to want to sure. follow and stalk because it's a stalking thing yeah you know what i mean it's like paying to stalk someone what? In some ways, like, I don't, like, I, I find, like, yeah, watch some random porn, no worries. Like, fucking, it's not as personal, but I think it's, I find the personal aspect for some that reason. That is true, because that's weird, like a, you know, because it's like, oh no, but I want to pay for them. That's a big benefit of in supporting the, me on Patreon, is you get to connect with my stuff on a more personal level. You get more of me. Exactly. You join a community yeah. of people that are into my stuff and talk about it, and I'll pop in every now and then. Yeah. But I'm not also showing you my whole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? It's crazy, man. Yeah. I can't help but look, and you know, I understand that I'm reflecting my own fears, my own insecurities well, over the subject. Legit, you know? I was talking to this, this dainty girl she's when I was setting up the day I was like oh could you show us a day in your life and she goes look most of my day is boring most of my day is literally sitting on OnlyFans yeah. for like 12 hours a day she's showing me her screen time she's not lying yeah talking to people and responding back to people who are like customers and buying her videos or sending her tips and yeah. you know going back and forth for these people so it's it's a super personal connection that you're paying for yeah, yeah. a lot of the time with these with these girls which is you know what you pay, what you pay for, and most people will be fine. But there's some, you know, I've had creeps. Yeah, right? and I've had I, creeps. I don't, I don't work in a field that necessarily attracts them. No, you work in sex work. That's where they are. Hundred percent. So that's absolutely a concern. Yeah, and you know, if you're not making a lot of money, where you can move to a nice 
area behind the gate yeah. <laughs> and have security cameras everywhere and all that kind of shit. Yeah, it's very scary. Something yeah. like that does have. Yeah, they can protect you themselves, know. you know. But yeah, it's definitely something that makes me anxious as a person, even just thinking about, you know. And yeah, once again, like I, I know without dropping any names, there are people in Australia that make content directed at kids. And they're on there going, check out our OnlyFans. Yeah. And that's as bad as grooming. Yes, you're nearly a pedo, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, I don't like that. Like, if you want kids to watch you have sex, that's just as bad as fucking wanting the kid. It's weird. It's not it is, cool. I don't it like it. And I, I, think, yeah. I think that... that I think that social media, because this, this whole conversation of should social media ban these OnlyFans creators, because a lot of a lot of policies are if you promote the OnlyFans thing, it should get banned. Yeah. I think it should be more like, uh, like a lot of the alcohol and cigarette companies, yeah. and tobacco things, where they can have an account, but it should be set up in a way that only people who are verified ages over the 18 can even follow you or engage with your stuff or even see it, yeah. I think. Because if you don't do that, you have what we see now all the time on TikTok and social media of, of yeah, people doing prank videos that attract 10 year old boys. Yeah. And then, you know, every month posted their OnlyFans with yeah. their fucking girls or getting fucked or showing their pussy or whatever they're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, you can't mix them. No. It needs to be one or the other. 100%. Yeah, it's creepy. It's like the, it's like if the Wiggles did porn. Yeah, yeah. And go, oh, yeah, but the porn is for only 18-year-olds. It's like, yeah, but that's not your audience and you know it. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, it's fucking creepy, man. But, you know, all the power to anyone doing their thing. She's crushing it. Yeah, she's crushing <laughs> it and fucking much respect. Yeah. You know, like whatever you want to do with your life go hard just make sure it makes you happy and it's not somewhat destroying your soul because I do know people that have destroyed their souls doing things like that and can't live with it I think it's a very very rare individual that can yeah, 100%. enjoy it and I, I've I've reckon I've, I've met a few people <coughs> who do it I reckon I've met maybe maybe like three people who like genuinely enjoy it and love it I've met like two big only fans girls who are loving it yeah. and then I've met like one prostitute who yeah. I talked to that she seemed to love it yeah, I wasn't sure. a customer right? <laughs> the fucking comments. she was at the show <laughs> oh I met two prostitutes there yeah, yeah, true, yeah there was yeah, one yeah. at the show that seemed to love it yeah yeah yeah. I get a lot of sex workers at my shows that's interesting bro. I do I get a lot yeah and I don't know why I don't feel like I've put it that out there although maybe now I will with this OnlyFans video yeah yeah even more that's my goal it's my yeah, plan to get all the sex workers, yeah. workers watching <laughs> take other guys money through that yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah I'll just skip the hard bit you know they're, they're taking Craig's money yeah, yeah. they're giving it to me <laughs> you're the middle man yeah I'm the pimp <laughs> <laughs> provided the jokes the laugh pimp yeah well thanks again for having me bro it's really no good worries, to catch dude. up with you where can people find you what are you working on um, so we've got a THC album coming out um, that's going to be uh, THC's Tasmanian Hip Hop Collective um, people will be able to find that in a few months I, my name's Greeley, I'm on Spotify I'm on YouTube, all the streaming platforms on Facebook, Instagram but yeah we're just working on music down in Tassie, I really want to get back into doing some more comedy yeah. Um, and yeah bro, just getting around and hopefully waiting for you to come back to Tassie for a holiday and take yeah. out fishing. Yeah, that'd be fucking yeah, awesome. That'd be the shit. Yeah, when I get my the metal out of my mouth, that'll be good. Yeah, we can fish with the metal in your mouth. <laughs> yeah, we could. We could. <laughs> all right, it. check out Greeley all over social media. Thanks, guys. Much Talk love, guys. Next Sunday. Bye.